All right, hey everybody. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about what it's like to be a chemist in 2023. Um, so I'm a chemical engineer, so this is like a bad perspective, but here's what I think it would take to be a chemist in 2023. Uh, and so I just wanna mention, I have a talk later today uh, about lane chain and paper QA. Um, it's kind of like a round table of everybody working on adding chat features to documents. So that is how do you build like chat GPT, but it knows like your bibliography or your papers or some document you want to ask questions about. So I'm going to talk a tiny bit about this today, but you can go see that Lang Chang workshop. I think it's at, um, I'm not good with time zones, 11 central time. Yeah. All right. So I got mid journey last night, so I have to show two pictures. I apologize. You guys are probably so sick of seeing these things, but here's a chemist in 3023. Um, so this is where we're going. Um, and then I just have been like, so impressed with its ability to, to like take celebrities. So this is Albert Einstein, uh, doing a photo shoot. Um, all right, let's go, go on to real stuff now. So I want to, first of all, Kevin's talk was awesome. Like I love the way he's thinking about this. I think it's exactly, that's right. That thermoelectric paper from 2019, a real sleeper hit. I saw that presented a long time ago, and I think about the paper all the time. Such a cool idea. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about my philosophy similar um, in a minute. But I want to just give some practical stuff about like, how do you, how can you be um, keeping up with AI right now? And how do you use these tools to accomplish uh, really cool stuff? Okay, so this is this is crazy. But this is the meme, I think, right now is like, if you're using Google search, like, what are you thinking? Uh, you need to be using Bing chat. Like that is the, the top right now. So I'm going to start with a tier list. So if you guys aren't familiar with tier lists, this is like my opinionated ranking of how to look up information doing in chemistry. So S tier is paper QA. Now this is opinionated. This is my tool. There's other great tools out there that basically allow you to ask questions of research papers. So take your whole library, put it in a tool, and you can get, um, you know, uh, grounded answers with a chat GPT like interface, like, you know, why is equivariance important for diffusion models? And it will give you back a paragraph with citations in it. Um, sort of A tier. So if you don't want to go, paper QA is kind of annoying to use. It's not great. I've been working, trying to write an interface to it. I don't have a lot of time. Uh, but so uh, A tier, chat GPT plugins. So this is chat GPT plus accessing Wolfram Alpha, accessing um, the internet. Uh, accessing your own set of uh, uh, documents, really great stuff. And then Bing Chat, another really good way to search for information. In fact, Bing Chat is what I use a lot personally. If I'm like, I want to do a quick literature search, or I want to look up a, a tool, or not a tool, like a, a, some concept. B tier. So I would say this used to be S tier. Perplexity is a really great tool. I think if you don't have Bing Chat, if you're not in the Bing Chat beta, you know, or if you're not in the Chat GPT plugin alpha. Um, perplexity is a great tool, perplexity.ai. That should be your go-to. You shouldn't be Google searching things in 2023. You should be going to perplexity as a, as a first pass. Um, C tier, chat GPT. Chat GPT is really good for like, you know, ideation, writing code, things like that. But I would say it's better than a Google search for sort of simple information. But if you want to get technical information, definitely any of these things above. D tier, um, other chat models. Uh, I haven't seen great performance from them, but this is something which I'm sure will change soon. And then F tier, uh, doing a Google search. Um, so Google searches, of course, if you like need to look up something specific, like the name of a restaurant or something, but any kind of science stuff, like right now, F, F tier is, is web search. And then of course, below F tier is Google Scholar search. I don't understand what is going on with Google Scholar search, but you can barely find papers with it. All right, great. So that's how you should look up information. Then I thought I'd give some specific examples of how to use GPT-4. I'm sure if you guys are on Twitter, like every 10 minutes, there's a Twitter thread of like, you're all using GPT-4 wrong. Here are 10 tips to use it. Okay, so here's my 10 tips. I'm sorry. Um, so, but I just want to get everyone. So I think a lot of people think GPT-4 is like an oracle, like you're like, write the code to do this. But I think it's much more like a dialogue, right? It's it's presented as a chat interface. Um, so as a practical point of view, how do you get chat GPT or how do you get GPT-4? You can purchase chat GPT plus, or you can get access to the API. Um, so here's an example. Rewrite the following code to use multi-threading for the compute function. So this is something I did is that I wanted some code that was slow to be multi-threaded. So I asked GPT-4 to rewrite it to be multi-threaded and it did a fine job. Um, rewrite the class 
below to use this new API. Then I would copy paste the API docs and then I copy paste the file. So this is an example of like when I wanted, I had a, um, basically I was doing Gaussian process regression and I wanted the Gaussian process regression to take in a string like what Kevin was showing instead of taking in um, a vector. And so I showed it how the OpenAI embeddings work and then I GPT-4 rewrote it. Write unit tests for this code. I hate writing unit tests. Um, I'm sure some people like it, but just, just say GPT-4, write some unit tests. And they're not perfect. You have to go edit them, but there's just this barrier that's being crossed by writing all the unit tests to start with. And then it's much easier to iterate a little bit. Um, another one. So <clears throat> if you're writing Python code in 2023, you're probably familiar with type hints, which I don't really understand type hints that much. Like, I think it's cool as like a way for me to see what's going on, but then, um, it's like a real Byzantine puzzle about getting everything consistent and passing from, uh, the type checkers, but GPT-4 is really good at that. And then like kind of simple questions, like, is this code is slow, rewrite it to be faster. Sounds silly, but what's great about GPT-4 is it'll give you be like, hey, here are three ideas. I implemented all three of them. And then you can be like, no, just do one of them. So it really is like having a very intelligent um, assistant that you can talk with. And so I know a lot of people are skeptical of GPT-4 or say it only got this score on this benchmark. But what's really powerful about it is this dialogue. It's really about being able to communicate what your intentions are in a few steps. So if you try it out and you're not impressed, try talking to it a little bit. Oh yeah, convert this Python to Rust. So Rust, very cool, very, very exciting language to me, but I never quite have had a reason to learn it, but you can actually start getting, you can get started learning Rust by basically having Python code be ported to Rust by GPT-4. Okay, so I want to just now talk a little bit about like what this looks like for finding new information. Um, so here's a specific example. Like if I ask Chad G or GPT 3.5. So GPT 3.5 is the original model of chat GPT. What is the reason for making a bi-specific antibody for CD38 binding? Kind of a technical question. And, G and chat GPT gives an answer that you might like. It's seemingly correct. It feels like something out of Wikipedia, but it's actually not correct. Um, and this is where I think chat GPT is just, it's not grounded. And so it shouldn't really be used for technical information. But if you want to know like, you know, what a, what a thermodynamic cycle is, it's probably great. So now this is this paper QA thing where I have it do a Google Scholar search, download some papers, embed the text into a vector database. And then we do this a second time. It does a really good job of basically drawing upon real scientific papers and looking at specific text in there and gives a correct answer and it gives a citation. And then I went farther and packaged this up into an open source tool called paper QA. So now this tool, basically you upload PDFs. And then you can ask like, how can carbon nanotubes be manufactured at large scale? And it gives you a paragraph of text with citations. Now it gives page numbers, um, really cool tool. Um, and so I think I have like one little demo about what I did last night. So I couldn't sleep. So I wrote paper QA as an agent. So now I've tried to automate like how I do a literature search. So I gave um, an agent, so an LLM, I gave it some tools and I'll talk a little bit about this in a minute. I gave it tools to go do a search over papers, to read papers. So I told the LLM it has access to a researcher that will read papers and summarize important information. That researcher is actually another instance of the language model, right? So GPT-4 thinks it's asking a researcher, but the researcher is GPT-4 as well. It's confusing. But basically I tried to automate all the steps of literature search, like downloading papers, checking if the information is in there. How much information do I have? Go search for more papers then try to answer the question. And what's really cool about this demo, and I'll talk way more about this demo um, this afternoon at my second talk. Um, basically, it tries to answer this question of why do birds flock and it fails. And it realizes that it needs more papers with specific information. So then it goes back and does another liter literature search and another parsing through papers with more, with a different kind of keyword search. Anyway, so like this is just something I whipped up last night. The fact that I wrote it in like a couple hours last night is insane that we're able to do just stuff that would have been like, you know, a 100 person research project deep mind in like a few hours. So you got to pay attention to this field. It's incredible. Okay. So let's talk about how you make demos like that. And this is where I think the future is, is how do you basically take these large language models and give them access to tools and let them drive science or planning forward. And this is neurosymbolic computing. And so I just want to give a little, this is from the GPT-4 system card. Um, 
basically about doing neurosymbolic informatics. I've presented this before on Twitter, but I'll just you know reiterate this is we can give these things tools like a web search, pubchem search, LLM code model. So that is like writing computer code and executing code, calculator, Python, synthesis planning, all these things. Um, and then we can give a question like design a compound with the same mechanism as satinib and purchase it. And basically the LLMs know how to use tools. So like it does a literature search about what is this drug and what is its mechanism of action? And it learns about other drugs that use this mechanism of action. Then it finds out what's the chemical structure of these things. Then we could use some of Kevin's tools to like figure out what's the melting point of this or what's the solubility of this compound. And then it does a patent search to see if this compound is novel or not. Then it says, you know, can I purchase this compound? If it can purchase the compound, then it purchases it from a catalog. Um, and then you end up with a compound, basically, that has similar properties, has been reported in literature as active against this mechanism, and or against this target for a drug, and also something which is not patented and available commercially. Um, cool. Uh, I have no idea what time it is. Let me see. Okay, I have like one minute left. So um, yeah, I'll just reiterate Kevin's, like, something I've been thinking about a lot is that... Um, Okay, so here's here's how we think about chemistry materials. We synthesize something, then we have this like platonic ideal of what we have made, like based on the chemical structure or what we think the atomic structure is, and then we go measure the properties, right? So I'm thinking like cut this out. Um, the, how we synthesize something is is what we can act on. That is how we act on our world. Like that is what we report, tell a student to do make, that is to make this, we, this is what we put in our papers, right? This structure, what we think we made is sort of a collective hallucination. It's a nice mental model, but what we really have is a set of properties, right? We make something and we can measure the properties and we can act on it. And I think we're at the point now where the LLMs can work directly with what is actionable, what the synthesis. And what's the benefit of working with synthesis? The benefit of working with synthesis is that everything we propose is synthesizable because we're literally writing down how you make it, right? And so we can skip over this middle part and it's beautiful and we'll keep teaching it. It's a good mental model. But I think we're reaching a point in, in, in science now where we can actually work directly in synthesis and go to properties. And that's really where we want to act. Okay, great. Um, this is some examples in chemistry. I'll just skip over those. Okay, conclusions. Um, wow. All right. Great. So that's my talk. Uh, happy to take any questions. Thank you. That was great. Um, yeah, let's open the floor. Uh, anybody have questions for Andrew? So it's it's about finding the most um, fundamental representation of a particular entity, which in this in this case is chemicals, isn't it? Because I mean, you're skipping structure. You're basically saying let's go to synthesis because that's the step before. I mean, it's really interesting because I come from biology, and this is this is exactly the discussion that that we are having there. Like, do you represent proteins versus nucleotides versus RNA um, versus atoms in structures? Um, but 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 yeah. So it's it's quite a cool direction to see the field going. I wonder about how much data you, you actually have on that, because I assume that protocols are very difficult to, um, let's say, computationally represent, right? Except for natural text. Yeah, that's a great question. I think this is a forward-looking statement, OK? And so right now, I think, like Kevin showed that we can do this, um, I think with like alloy compositions in, in his paper. And I think that was like a really cool way. And I think we're, we're working towards processing. So I don't, I'm not ready yet to share the results, but in my group, we're, we're working towards working with composition and processing for, for doing like reactions and, and catalyst design. And we're, we're, I think we can show good results there. But looking forward, right, I think we're right around the corner from being able to read papers with figures and text and tables. And I think there's like, like last night, the Flamingo model from DeepMind was released by um, Stability. So now we can actually have a paragraph of text with an image and it all can be read into a model and represented explicitly. Um, and so I think protocols are probably possible right now. Protocols with tables and images are possible, I think, with access to closed proprietary, like with GPT-4 image, which is not available to everyone. But so you got to imagine pretty soon, we can work in the synthesis representation. And I think the synthesis representation, that is what we act on, right? That's how we communicate what we're making to other people. 
And so I think like the whole mental model of what we have actually made or how the system works is really cool. And that's science and I'm all about it. But I think we're at this point now where we can start driving experiments and start to, you know, predicting properties without having to stop and find the perfect mental model. Yeah, I, th I think that's very interesting. There, there are similar questions and materials around process, structure, property, relationships. So a lot of the same questions. Um, I have so many questions about that demo, but I think I will save some of them because I think you'll probably address them at your at your seminar later today. Uh, but you know, one question I guess is, how do you how do you get from the model when it is uncertain and needs more information? Like, what is the process there? You know, Ben, it was funny. There was a paper that came out recently called like reflection or something or reflection action or something. And it was like, they tried to come up with this mathematical model so that they could tell when their LLM was getting confused or caught in a cycle. And I just thought like, why don't you just have an LLM check if the LLM is caught in a cycle? And that seems to work pretty well as well. So then there's like the question of like, how can I tell if the L, if, you know, if it's not certain or not, you just ask. And it's kind of freaky, like how often that kind of approach works, right? And so I think the answer to all of your questions, Ben, is just ask. Great. Love it.